On this week's In Cycle, it's all about new tech as the World Tour adopts discs for the cobbled classics. It's not a secret that as well all our competitors being present in the World Tour have as well disc -like bikes ready to race. The road to Rio is well underway and Wayne Dahl talks about his ambitions for the track. Obviously I would be gutted if I didn't go to the Olympics, didn't make that, that starting four, but if I don't make it it's because there's four people who are better than me. Ahead of this week's Amstel Gold Race, Roxanne Kneitemann reflects on the memory of her father. I knew really not. I knew only that he was ever a world champion. And how, what, where, when. I knew it really not. But first, InCycle spent a week tracking King of the Cobbles, Tom Bonin, as he looked to take a record-breaking fifth, Harry Roubaix. First time I rode my bike, I crashed very hard. <laughs> I was at my grandparents' house and the driveway's a little bit downhill. I went over the handlebars with my face into a tree and my teeth were all through my upper lip and I didn't ride the bike for another three months. <laughs> That's my first memory of a bike ride. My older son is born in the same year, so he tried to be a rider. So I, I saw them 15, 17, 18, and I knew already then that Tom Bono was a really strong, strong rider. I was winning Flanders, Roubaix, world champion. Everybody wanted uh, some, something from him. Interview, television, newspapers, sponsors, fan clubs. Now it's different, it's 10 years later. But he's still, he's still the hero. When Tom Bonin is at the race, he's always uh, an headline. Yeah, there was a moment in his career where he was a little bit, let's say, also, I would say, yeah, maybe a sex symbol. Around 2005, six, seven, he was like uh, really uh, uh, chased by uh, uh, magazine and media that normally you don't see in cycling. I think he was. He was big from the beginning. Um, he was born as a, as a star. He's good at our races. We're in Belgium, so we love the cobblestones, and those are the most important races. Um, and Tom is the best cobblestone rider ever. He's even bigger than uh, Eddie Merckx. Uh, he's bigger than Fabian Cancellara. Just look at the numbers. Tom won 21 cobblestone classics and semi-classics. Fabian Cancellara only won nine, so there's no comparison at all. And I think that's a special thing about him. It's been more than just a few months or just a few years. It's like 15 years now that he's that popular. like a movie star on the bike. This week and the next week, and these are the, the two glory days for him, and, and so, not only for him, but also for the teams. We are in the middle of Kerker, Belgium, in the cafe of Tambon. The sport has come together here. And now we are watching the TV, the Tour of Flanders. In the first years, it was you know, a world champion, a victorist every year. But now it's, it's less, but we still support him. I think he, he tried today, but he will more next week. This is Group 4, Bonin, Os and Utsenko. Chasing him behind as well. It's a lot of work to do. Tour de Flanders, Tom... Uh... Tom did a good race, uh, um, maybe missed a little bit uh, in the final, but it was it was in the action when it was important to be to be there. If you talk with him, it's clear that on Sunday uh, Paris Roubaix is the most important race. He's a real leader, and you feel that in so many ways. But also on training, you can see when he puts his foot in the pedal. We are leaving. Uh, he's not looking behind, he does his own thing and everybody follows. Yeah, I think he's the most important factor in our, in our team. He knows how to focus to a race, but he also knows how to, how you say, decompress afterwards. And uh, yeah, also then it's really nice to have him with you. We went to, to Scandal Race and there I think Tom uh, show again, uh, showed again uh, the altruism is, he has, the capacity, the, the capability to be, um, to be a teammate, to be a road captain. Uh, he did really well for Marcel. Coming up 
Gladys on the left look out for Greifel. It's Kittle all the way. On the massage table, uh, most of the time, he talks about his kids, but when it's not that, he talks about uh, cars. Not so, about, not so much about cycling. Most of the time he sleeps. When he's tired, he sleeps. So then you have to wake him up when, when you're finished. Sunday, you have to win or you have to be close to the podium. But for us, it's, it's a week like, like all the other weeks. My dream, I don't dream much, but my dream is that he stops on a high level. First of all, he wants to perform at high level for himself, for his teammates. He's a, he's a bike race, he loves, he loves to bike, he loves to do his job. And then I think the record it will be a consequence of this. There was five strong riders with him, but he did what he had to do. Just yeah, just second is uh, for him. It's yeah, it's it's a loss. On the other hand, I think the fight he made to come back it was already a big fight, and he made it. Long race, he he had to be ready, and he was ready. He was very strong. We, we always talked quiet in the radio, calm in the radio. So we knew we were, he was good. You saw he was only riding to win, not to lose. Um, but he always does that. And that make him, makes him also a very big rider, a very big heart and a very big uh, fighter also. Maybe next year. A British cyclist with precocious talent on the track a burning passion for the road and a clever knack for picking up a jersey or two. You may well think you know who we're talking about, but think again, because on this occasion, the references are for 22-year-old Owain Duhl. Strongly in contention for a spot in Great Britain's team pursuit for the Olympics this year, Duhl's balancing track time with racing on the road, all alongside and under the guidance of Bradley Wiggins, a man who's trodden the same path to some considerable success. Obviously, he's just the ultimate professional at the end of the day. You just see how he just approaches everything, and and you kind of you just see, see how he works. And being close to that, I think it's just an experience in itself. I think we've got an advantage over everyone in the sense with Team Wiggins. I think uh, literally there's nothing which isn't taken care of, which we need for the Olympics. You know, without Team Wiggins and obviously having Brad's name to it and Brad in the team, we wouldn't be in races like California, Dubai, and you know, not many track squads get to train together every day and race together. Everyone in the team is like massively ambitious and wants to do well, so it's kind of a very stress-free environment, and everyone knows Rio is the main goal for the majority of us. High threshold training on the track may offer more explosive power on the road, but even that has its dangers. Unfortunately, I crashed in Dubai, but sometimes they, they're unavoidable things. So like in the bunch sprints, for example, I probably won't take as many risks, or sometimes I just won't even sprint if I'm thinking it's going to be a dodgy finish. It's always in the back of your mind. Not that he held back last year at the Tour of Britain, taking the points jersey and a place on the overall podium. I was hoping for kind of maybe a few, few top tens, be kind of prominent on a few stages I thought would suit me. Um, but yeah, it's kind of maybe mixing it up there every day was, I finished third overall was more than I expected, yeah. I still get goosebumps thinking about that last stage in London with, you know, people like Brad and that leading me out. Bradley Wiggins coming onto the front for Team Wiggins, setting the pace very high, trying to set it up in the final sprint for Owen Duhl. Duhl may take Wiggins' wheel again in August, this time for a medal in the velodrome. But it was one of his Welsh compatriots who first ignited Duhl's Olympic ambitions. Beijing was 2008. I remember watching, because um, I only just started cycling, then I was with the Mainly Flyers, which is the same club as you know Luke Rowe, Gary Thomas. Watching him win the Olympics by such a margin, I think that was just unbelievable. And that was kind of the moment I thought, that that's what I'd love to do. It's the track. A dream eight years in the making, but even with less than four months to go, its realisation is not guaranteed. Obviously, I would be gutted if I didn't go to the Olympics, didn't make that, that start in four, but if I don't make it, it's because there's four people who are better than me. And everything we do is evidence-based. Brad is Brad and Cavs Cav, but at the end of the day, if they're not producing the numbers and they're slowing the team down, 
the coach will have no qualms about taking him out of the team. You can't hide on the track, uh, you can't bluff it. So yeah, if I, if I don't go, it's because I'm not good enough, it's plain and simple. There's only four spots and there's about eight of you going for it. Um, so it is hard, but the, I think having that depth of talent is a massive advantage. You know, I think that's why we're quite dominant, the Aussies are quite dominant, same as the Kiwis. I think it's because there's so many riders always pushing for those spots and no one's ever safe. Despite the uncertainty, Dool has already achieved one of his big career goals and now is looking to next year and beyond. When I first got in the academy when I was 18, every year we had to write you four years. Every, what you wanted to do every year was goals. And for this year it was Olympic gold and, and um, professional contract. Obviously I can't say who I've signed for, but I think it's the perfect team for me and hopefully it will be fruitful. The classics is kind of what I'd like to aim for. I think it kind of suits my riding ability, but obviously coming from an amateur to a, to a pro, you just never know really. The classics are what kind of gets me excited and what I'd like to be part of, you know, seeing what like what Luke Rowe did recently at uh, Head News Blood coming forth, you know, stuff like that is just yeah, goosebumps. I think um, road cycling as a whole, for me anyway, I find it's a lot more enjoyable. That's kind of where hopefully my future lies and that's kind of what I want to do. Those races where you kind of you're suffering for 170, 180k just to have your shot in the last 5k, you know, it's that it's that kind of buzz I personally get when like I've kind of saved as much as I can or like I said suffered all day just to just be in with a shout of trying to go for a result, trying to get a win. It's just yeah, for me, that's what makes road cycling amazing. Even amongst the razzmatazz and excitement of the cobbled season, cycling's eagle-eyed have been able to spot a new addition to the Lampre Merida team. The gradual revolution of disc brakes in professional cycling has achieved its biggest breakthrough to date. It's not a secret that as well all our competitors being present in the World Tour have as well disc brake bikes ready to race. It's just a question uh, at what time the team is really ambitious enough to make it come true. For us, the Northern Classics now is a perfect test terrain and normally uh, those classic races in Belgium and uh, north of France are well known for uh, quite cold, windy and uh, wet conditions. That is a nice testing field. Following last year's introduction of the lightweight Scultura to Lampre's arsenal, Merida set about preparing a frame for a disc version that could offer the team the same unique performance and comfort. In this, they have succeeded. The result, they hope, gives Lampre's riders the widest choice of bike of any team in the peloton. The biggest the uh, challenge is to keep the excellent weight and the weight is not uh, a question mark towards frame and fork because here the weight penalties uh, let's say it, in our hands because we are responsible for the frame. All the components are sold on board from other sources. The frame we have an extra amount of weight including the fork of about uh, 95 grams. That's reasonable if you consider that we have different dropouts along the rear base and uh, a much more solid fork. If we uh, simply compare all the components related to braking, we end up today at uh, roughly 700 grams of weight penalty. That means if we have a Scultura rim brake, which is 6.7 kilograms ready to race, 100 grams below the UCI weight limit, we have 7.4 for the equivalent uh, Scultura disc brake bike. And if you are a 60 kilogram skinny uh, mountain climber, you might consider about uh, if it's worth to take this extra amount of weight in consideration. If at the other hand, you might save some time in a fast descent due to better controlled braking. Introducing the Sculptura disc partway through the season would appear to some a potentially risky move. While riders are increasingly convinced of the performance benefits, preparing the team's mechanics was crucial if the introduction was to go as smoothly as possible. We really did our best to make them aware with the new technology. We sent some uh, race mechanics of our pro mountain bike team and they use hydraulic disc brakes since the decade to uh, train them how to get uh, rid of troubles. Yeah. And uh, after, I would say, uh, two weeks of intense training, assembling uh, and testing, now at least the fear is gone. 
While the thought of in-race wheel changes is enough to keep any mechanic up at night, the Skultura Discs Rapid Axle technology is the latest design to ensure wheel changes with discs are as fast as current rim brakes. If you open uh, the RAT system, it's uh, moving the QR lever, twisting 90 degree and pulling out the axle. The wheel drops out and because there are no safety hooks like uh, they have to be placed for regular rim brake wheels, the operation itself is even faster. Such as being disc brakes progress in the early season, don't be surprised if by this time next season all teams have a disc brake option for the cobbled classics. While for the rest of the World Tour teams, introducing discs at the sharp end of the cobbled classic season was too big a gamble to take, all involved with Lampre Merida are expecting their bold move to pay off and that reward could come sooner rather than later. No one of us is expecting one of our riders to be on the podium. Let's say our season starts with uh, the short one-week stage race, races uh, starting during the next weeks. And for us it was quite important now to have uh, almost two weeks in a row in uh, serious conditions to build up trust. And uh, we will intensely discuss with uh, team management and racers what we are going to do. But I'm quite sure that if, for example, Giro d'Italia mountain stages, there might be uh, cold, and uh, wet weather with dangerous descents, we might even use them in the high mountains. Roxanne Knetemann has her own story. A professional since 2006, she currently rides for Brabo Live, but her connection with cycling runs far deeper, as she is the daughter of Jerry Knetemann, a former world champion and two-time winner of the Amstel Gold Race. As a youngster, Roxanne was aware parents of her classmates knew her father, but the rest was totally unknown to her. I really didn't know. I just knew that he was a world champion. But how, where, when, I really didn't know. He never spoke about it. I knew he was a national team coach. I just didn't know what he had done in the past. It was after I started to race myself that I was confronted with it. Simply because people think it is nice to discuss it with you. And also because they put a name tag on you. Because you are the daughter of. It wasn't until after her father's death that Roxanne became curious and started looking into his career and the sizable success he achieved. You see race results and then you think... OK. And especially when you see races that he won on TV, or even races that you ride yourself, then you really start to think, OK, that is really hard. So no, it wasn't really in my mind. Jerry Knetemann won the Amstel Gold Race twice in his career, so if there was a women's edition of the Great Race, would Roxanne try to win it and have her name in the history books alongside her father? <laughs> Absolutely. I'd circle it in my agenda, marketing capitals and everything. That would be something. When I drove over here and passed the Valkenberg, I thought to myself, how cool will it be when there's a women's edition on the Sunday? I would train harder than ever and be at the start with the highest morale. Absolutely. Voor moraal hier aan de start staan, ja, zeker weten. Jerry Knetman's second Amstel victory was the more remarkable as it came after a serious crash that left most thinking he wouldn't be able to compete with the best again. If you talk about the Amstel Gold Race, of course I would be highly motivated because he won this race twice. He won his first time when he was a first year pro and if I had to believe my mother, then this was his breakthrough. And then he won it again, ten years later, when nobody thought he would ever ride on the highest level again. We have the race on tape. I've seen it once or twice. Hell, I've watched it many times and it gives me goosebumps. And of course, it is emotionally charged because he is not with us anymore, but also because it was a great race. Every time I ride uphill on the Galemmerberg, then I think this is where he did his winning attack. That always improves my morale and I think this is not the place where they will lose me. 
And that is absolutely because this has a certain meaning for me. Roxanne's pedigree's never been in doubt, but it's through her father's coaching she believes she's made her greatest improvements. Yes, of course. He was the best teacher you could dream of. In the beginning, right after he passed away, I really missed that. That's also the reason why I was out of sorts. Of course, also because of the whole situation, but especially in cycling, I just didn't know how to do it. Before his death, I was a person where not winning wasn't an option. That was me. I can still remember the first race after his death. I was nervous and I didn't feel as confident. I just didn't know how to handle all those emotions. Roxanne Knetemann has proven her worth on the women's tour and with time on her side, she still harbours big ambitions. Dreams. I still have a lot of dreams in cycling. And I really think... I do think that is the reason why I'm still doing this. I keep surprising myself. I grow every year. And every year I discover a new quality of myself. Or something I just can't do. And I still really enjoy that. If I stop enjoying that, then I think it must be time for kids. But for now, I'm just living my dreams. Ik vind het, ik, ik, ik leef gewoon mijn droom. That's all for this week. We'll see you next time. But until then, keep up to date with us on social media.